Chapter 4 Why was it, Sam wondered, that his Reebok squeaked loudly only when he was trying to sneak down the empty hallway of Los Robles High School? He tried to lighten his step as he passed down past the administration office and walked toward the next hallway. He passed row upon row of beige steel lockers and heard teachers calling off roll or describe something that they thought was humorous or exciting on television the previous night. Sam looked straight ahead as he tried to step quickly rather than walk and thumping all the way. He imagined for an instant that he had ability to float smoothly and gently above the splattered vinyl asbestos tile floor. It would be wonderful to sail just millimeters off the surface, the perfect control of pitch, yaw, and roll. But the sound of his biology teacher's voice brought him back to reality. He must have been a hundred feet, although it seemed like a thousand, from the double doors of the biology auditorium and lab. He slowed as he approached the door. Five feet, two feet, then finally one foot from the door. He stopped short. He looked at his watch. 8.45 a.m. He was 30 minutes late, and for the third time this school year. The session was just two months old, and this time he was really in for it. Perhaps this time he could slink in. His teacher, Mr. Timmerman, was so engrossed in his own universe when he was lecturing that he barely noticed any movement ten feet beyond his thick glasses. Sam put his eye close to the crack in the door. He watched the middle-aged, bespeckled man with the disheveled hair turn away from the classroom and toward the blackboard. This was his chance. As he reached for the door, a near catastrophe occurred. His thick biology textbook was on its way down to the floor and a certain loud crash. But Sam's quick reflexes saved what would have been the definitive announcement that Sam Alexander had arrived. Sam opened the door and stepped in. He held the door as it closed behind him. Turning toward the class, he sensed that all eyes were riveted on him. Most of his 35 or 30 classmates then turned away just as quickly. Sam looked toward the blackboard. Timmerman was still engaged. He tiptoed down the aisle and concentrated on grabbing the remaining open seat in the middle of the class. He thought it was best to approach from the rear. At the back of the class, he passed the punks. Instead of the typical laid-back Southern California dress, black leather and black jeans were well-worn rock band T-shirts. That was the standard punk issue that year. One of the most menacing-looking punks, Dozier, grabbed Sam's arm. Sam didn't resist as he stopped dead. His root was blocked by Dozier's leg. Dozier looked Sam up and down spending most of his observation time on Sam's wild Hawaiian shirt. Dozier pulled Sam closer. Hey, man, that's truly a rad shirt you got on there, Dozier whispered. Thanks, I appreciate that from such an illustrious fashion critic as yourself, Sam replied. He pulled his arm away sharply and quickly reached his chair. He looked across the room. A red-headed, green-eyed beauty gave him a big smile. Sam paused and gave her a nod. Tiberman, scribbing and diagramming madly at the blackboard, droned on. It is at this point that the starch compounds are transformed into usable energy by ATP. Sam slid into his chair. Without turning, Timberman asked. And just what might that new substance be? Samuel. Timberman turned quickly on his heels and leaned against his combination lab table and lectern. Sam sank into his chair, his book still in his lap. He turned white. He seemed lost. Looking around the room, he saw the smiles, he heard the snickers, and felt the general pleasure that his classmates were having at his expense. He squirmed under Timmerman's gaze. He looked toward the cute red-headed girl, Lisa Marie. Her head was down. Suddenly, she looked sympathetically towards Sam. He heard the snickering and the whispering and felt the eyes on him again. My God, he thought, the cruelty of kids his age. His thoughts slowed his response to his now approaching teacher. Uh, what was
was that, Mr. Timmerman? Sam asked plaintively. There were a few more chuckles. Sam heard Dozier chortle. Duh, where am I, coach? Did we win? Two of the greasy friends nearby whispered. Timmerman stopped midway from the front of the classroom and looked over Dozier. Mr. Dozier, at least Mr. Alexander is passing this course. As to you, you're just on the edge of failing this course. Dozier glared at Timmerman. He did not like to be embarrassed or humiliated in front of his peers. This time, their snickering was directed at Dozier. Timmerman looked down at Sam. ATP transforms. He gestured to Sam to finish the sentence. Uh, ATP transfers starch to uh, sugar. Sensing the victory of the forces of good over evil, his classmates began to cheer and shout approval. Timberman held up his hands. Okay, silence, let's have calm in here while I talk to Sam. Sam apprehensively stared at his teacher. Sam, that's correct. Now, just one more simple question. You're late again. What is your creative excuse this time? Sam looked into Timmerman's eyes. The truth was definitely necessary here. In a nanosecond, he determined that his teacher would receive any carefully concocted scenario with unmitigated scorn. In other words, Sam, he said to himself, no bullshit. No matter how incredible or ridiculous his explanation would be, to his teachers and his classmates, Sam would tell the truth. His face sagged. If I told you, Mr. Timmerman, you wouldn't believe me. You'd think I was nuts. The greaser next to Dozier shook his head and snorted. Come on, man, let's hear it. Timmerman looked at the greaser, then back at Sam. Try me. Sam took a deep breath and sat up in his chair. Well, I had to check my SETI experiment sort of form of biology, like exobiology. Timmerman looked as though he were genuinely interested. He folded his arms and cocked his head, waiting for more information. Really? Tell us about it in, in 25 words or less. What does SETI mean? Sam became slightly excited at the prospect of telling a near intellectual equal about his search and experiment. He started to answer, but... Briefly, he scanned the room. All eyes were on him now. Nervousness began to creep in again. It, uh, it's an acronym. It stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. The room broke out in laughter. Only one classmate didn't laugh, the red-haired girl. She just stared at Sam. Sam heard a few catcalls, a few accusations of nerd. That was a misnomer, however. He was too good-looking or cute, as many of the girls secretly thought, to be called a nerd. His dress was sometimes strange or different, but he didn't carry a plastic pocket protector in his shirt pocket, and he didn't have caked on dirt around his ears or neck. He didn't plaster down his hair with cooking oil, and he didn't walk like a chicken. His build was better than those of most of his fellow males in the classroom. What set him apart were his intelligence and his quiet personality. Many of the young females were attracted by his air of mystery and the power of his mind and his firm build. Now, however, his biology classmates were laughing at him, not with him. Timmerman said, Quiet class, most of you don't even know where Senegal is located, let alone Saturn or Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. Sam, please explain further. I'm looking for radio signals from other intelligent civilizations. There were more chuckles. But interest, on the other hand, was rising. The greaser leaned over to Dozier and whispered for everyone to hear. Man, this dude's a poser. Timmerman stepped toward the greaser. Mr. Craig, please just shut up. The frustrated teacher turned and walked back to his podium. Enough of this, Alexander. No more tardius. Alien civilizations or no? Craig leaned over to Sam. Hey, man, that excuse was really great. Extremely great. Sam didn't acknowledge the vacuous comment. I 
wonder why, Mitch said. Ephraim took a gigantic bite of his dripping peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I wonder why we don't have an indoor cafeteria. Rollo answered, Because the school people don't have the money to build one, dummy. Ephraim, squat and rotund, Rollo, skinny and truly nerdish, Mitch, smaller and shorter than Rollo. They sat under a canopy covering two dozen weather-beaten picnic tables in the schoolyard adjacent to the administration building. Around them, students chatted or laughed and stared at one another, making derisive remarks about teachers, school work, or other students. Occasionally, a basketball flew into the crowded eating area and landed in someone's pudding or applesauce. A loud fuck or shit would be heard, and if the kid who threw the ball were smaller than the kid who got it, a fight would start for sure. Money had a great deal to do with why Sam's three friends, also amateur operators, were sitting outside on picnic tables instead of in a large multi-purpose cafeteria. But it wasn't the only total explanation. In Kansas City, where winter temperatures sometimes went down to 20 degrees below zero with winds of 40 to 50 miles per hour, it would be difficult to eat lunch outside without freezing instantly or blowing into a nearby snowdrift. But in Southern California, especially in the temperate part of the state, lunch could be eaten outside in September or December or even February. And if it rained, the canopy would provide protection. At Sam's school, students could purchase hot food at the hog trough window, but experience had shown that eating the daily hot meal at Los Robles was taking one's life into one's hands. The nearby landfill was thought by the students to be the source of the food served. The unique odor was thought to be toxic waste byproducts. Sam walked toward the group's table with a disgusted look on his face. He threw his backpack on the table with a thud and plopped down next to his best buddy, Ephraim, who didn't miss a beat. He just kept eating. Hey, Sam, yo, what's up? Ephraim asked. His question filtered through a wad of bread, peanut butter, and jelly. Sam opened his pack and pulled out an empty, squashed lunch sack. He threw it in the middle of the table. His three friends stopped eating. Uh-oh, Rollo whispered. Again? Mitch said. Yep, Sam answered quietly. Ephraim stopped eating. A worried look crept across his face. You know, I got a feeling someone doesn't like us. Sam looked around the table. My locker has been hit twice, Rollo. Yours once, Mitch, how many times? Four, no, five times. Sam put his hand on Ephraim's shoulder. And you, good buddy, is it 12 now or 10? No, Ephraim said, actually 22. Sam looked around the schoolyard. Yep, I thought there was a T in there somewhere. Rollo leaned back and said excitedly, Listen, we have to fight these bastards. Why don't we rig up a step-up transformer and a solenoid switch? We wrap our lunches with aluminum foil, wire it to a transformer and a 9-volt battery, and zap. Somebody grabs it, and they get a couple thousand volts. Only a couple of milliamps. We don't want to kill anybody, Mitch said quickly. Even more quickly, Ephraim added, Yeah, sure, butt faces, and what happens if Mr. Rollins or Timmerman or that weasel-faced Mrs. Gooch goes snooping around on a surprise locker check? Sam turned to Ephraim. We'll all get had, because they'll know only the freaks in the ham radio and computer lab could rig up something like that. They all went back to eating, thinking and scheming, trying to design and rig an untraceable alarm punishment system for use against the enemy. Sam looked over. Mitch looked over at Sam. Hey, Sam, Mitch asked, reaching into his lunch bag. You want a banana? Mitch held up a mushy brown banana that had seen better days. My mom always gives me one. She say it'll keep my potassium up and keep me regular. Ephraim laughed. Will it keep your dick up too? Suddenly, Rollo suddenly looked at Mitch and scooted several inches away. You got diarrhea. 
No, anal vapor. Mitch shoved a banana in Roller's face. It's for constipation, not diarrhea, you fool. Efren dropped a sandwich. You guys, please, I'm trying to eat, Mitch said. Shit, Motormouth, nothing stops you ever from eating. Sam swung his legs under the table, leaned on his elbows and whispered, The hell with eating. Ephraim gave Sam a dirty look. Sam said quietly, Listen, fellow Electron and DX chasers, I think I may have hit the mother load last night with my SETI search. Ephraim completely ignored Sam. I wonder who is doing this to us, guys. Why is my locker being hit more than yours? Mitch and Rollo, however, leaned towards Sam. Sam tried to ignore Ephraim. I pulled out the data from an overnight stop search alarm message, Sam said. Then he opened his backpack and pulled out the crumpled computer printout generated by his SETI computer. Sam looked straight ahead, his expression turning from contemplation to fear, color drained from his face. Sam continued as he pointed to the pronounced spike jutting upward on the graph. If you look at the intensity of the spike in comparison to the background noise along the line of Ephraim held up his hand and said weakly, I think I know who smashed your lunch, Sam, yo. Sam was about to give Ephraim a shot in the arm with a swift fist for interrupting an explanation of radio signals sent by an extraterrestrial civilization. But when he looked past Ephraim, he saw that he would have to deal with a more immediate pressing problem. Looming over and ever closer, Sam was the punk dozier and his unkempt and tough guy friend, the less than brilliant Craig. Man, those two looked like they just stepped out of a mosh pit, Rollo whispered. Dozier sat next to Ephraim and gave him a toothy evil grin. Hey, Butterbutt, what's happening? Craig roared with laughter. Dozier grinned again and looked at Sam, then smiled, and that turned into a sneer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The last word trailed off, and Dozier looked at the computer printout. Then he grabbed it. Sam's face turned red. Hey, Dozier, he protested. He started to move, but Craig held him firmly in place. Sit down, geek. Ephraim, Rollo, and Mitch squirmed. A small crowd began to move toward the confrontation. As usual, trouble invariably switched on an unspoken communications link among students, telling them that a fight was about to begin. Sam's face was flushed with anger as three scared, stunned friends waited for the first blow to be thrown. Hey, man, we just want to talk. Dozier squinted the graft. He turned it upside down, then sideways. What is this shit, anyway? It's a graph for Rollins' science class, Sam said sharply. Craig leaned closer to Sam. Hey, man, why you want to take that science shit for? Why don't you take something useful like woodworking? Man, I made a great pen holder for my dad. That son of a bitch is so tough, my old man uses it to prop up the air conditioning he got in his garage workshop. Dozier tossed the chart back to Sam. Sam stuffed it into his backpack. Dozier looked directly at Ephraim. Ephraim's body quivered with fear. The sweet taste of peanut butter had turned into the coppery taste of panic, fear, and terror. Mission accomplished. Dozier turned back to Sam. Why so uptight, Alexander? I, I just want to congratulate you on that most bitchin' excuse you gave Timmerman this morning. Craig chimed in. Awesome. Can I talk to these space dudes you're talking to? Sam turned and looked up at Craig. He replied coldly. I haven't found them yet, so there's no one to talk to. Dozier shook his finger under Sam's nose. Now, don't you be lying to me, man. Craig put his hands on his hips. Hey, man, the guy's a poser. It was just a bullshit excuse. There ain't no space people. There ain't no space people. Sam sat silently, staring up at Craig. Then he turned back to Dozier. Dozier stared back. Timmerman made Dozier look foolish in front of the class, and Dozier blamed Sam. Dozier stood up and stretched. Well, buddy, he said, putting his arm around Craig. Timmerman believed, so what the hell? More power to the guy. He gave Sam a hard slap on the back. Sam stiffened. Under the table, he began to ball his hand into a fist. He had to use all of his willpower to keep from jumping up and popping Dozier in the mouth. Sam knew that with this tardiness record, 
getting into a fight now would not be a good idea. So he held back. Ephraim looked up and softly said to Dozier, You want some of my sandwich? Dozier stretched and yawned and rubbed his stomach. He stepped up to Sam and looked into Sam's eyes. No thanks, I already ate. Craig turned away from the table and grabbed Dozier's arm. Come on, man, let's split. Enough of this shit. Dozier followed, but not before making a last remark. See you burly dudes later. Sam and his friends watched the punks walk away. Terrified, Ephraim looked at Mitch. For a while there, I thought we were dead meat. Mitch answered, not with four of us sitting here, dip doofus. Sam watched Dozier and Craig melt into the mass of students. Ephraim turned to Sam and held his sandwich up to his friend's face. Sam, yo, you want some of my sandwich? Sam turned and stared blankly at Ephraim.